So it seems like someone, this this person dropped you in the ocean and said, okay, time to learn to swim. Don't mind that there's a storm coming in 10 minutes. This is episode zero. That's right. We count properly. So you're here. You're wondering, why are you here? Why did I click on this thing? What is the purpose of this? podcast. Well, the purpose is we're two dudes. We've been involved in uh, the Unix-like Linux and Unix OSs and open source for quite a while. And we've decided that we shouldn't just be limited to having conversations at conferences. Jeff and I both go to a bunch of conferences. Uh, We've met at a bunch of them. We end up having great conversations together, but they only happen so many times a year. And we were talking a couple weeks ago, and it was like, well, why aren't we just having conversations more often? And then logical step from there is, well, why aren't we just recording these and and sharing this so we can get other people involved in the conversation and kind of have a larger discussion? So with that, Jeff, why don't you uh, tell me and everyone else who's listening a little bit about yourself? All three of the people that are listening? Sure. All all three. So... Three, yeah. Well, we'll get to four eventually, but start, we'll start small with three. Um, so it seems like we've known each other for 10, 11, 12 years, something around there. And we met, it's been a while. It's been a year or so. It's, um, we met when in the Slackware channel, actually, originally. Um, I started out playing with Slackware in the 90s. And, you know, Slackware's got that challenge of you do everything yourself. And I liked that aspect, but it also meant when something broke, guess what I had to go do? I had to go seek help. And the easiest place to go get help was IRC. It was full of people that were very smart, somewhat social at times. Um, And it was just a good community. And so after I was done asking my questions and getting answers, I just kind of hung out there, I guess. And that's when you and I came into contact with each other. So we've been both, I don't know how closely I would say you were involved in Slackware, but you've definitely been in the community for a while. How much Slackware did you actually run back in those days? So the first system I got was a Slackware machine from a family friend, and I didn't know how to use it, really. So anytime I needed help, it was, well, I need to find somebody who actually knows about this. Uh, And so, yeah, IRC was was the way to go and a way to find help. And so a lot of the time back in the mid-90s, because I got that system in late 94, uh, was just basically just observing and trying to learn, asking a few questions here and there, just trying to pick up information where I could. But I wouldn't say that I was super active in the community. I was in it, but I was I was a lurker, I guess you could say, would be the term to use. A lurker. I think that's appropriate, yeah. So I didn't actually know, you knew who I was. Apparently I spoke a lot or I was very vocal or something. With the equivalent of being vocal on IRC, you, you get that. But uh, I didn't really know who you were at first, and I think I didn't really get to know you until I started going to Southeast Linux Fest conference. And that's when I started knowing you. I put a name to a face. And I was like, oh, that's that guy. That's right. And he's the guy who talks about Corrados and tearing cars apart and selling them. And I thought that was really neat because I was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to rip cars apart and figure out how they worked, just like everything else technical. And here was a guy who was actually doing that and selling the parts and making money and keeping his livelihood through selling parts that he'd torn off of cars. I was fascinated by that. That's, I think, one of the earliest memories I have of actually knowing who you were. And then as since then, it's been kind of, we see each other at all these conferences, and every time we're like, oh, yeah, hey, how you doing? And then it's, um, I guess it's just grown from there. But I think when I picked up Slackware early on, I didn't really know. Well, actually, I'll be honest. Part of the reason I picked Slackware to begin with is because nobody else I knew had even heard of it. and. That didn't say much because most people didn't know what Linux was then. I think it was like 95, 96. And I have this contrarian streak, which you're well aware of. I am. Yes, unfortunately. But that's part of what makes us have good conversations, to be honest. I picked Slackware because no one else had heard of it. And I was like, I'm going to do something that no one's done. Of course, there were people on the internet that were already doing it. In the early days, this is 94, 95, the internet was still, what do we call it? The information superhighway back then? Oh, yeah. Classic yeah. term. Yeah, yeah. And then I remember the World Wide Web was supposed to be this transitionary period. Like, for now, we'll just do this hypertext thing until we actually get the superhighway built. It's going to take a while to build the superhighway. We'll just kind of mess around with the web. Fast forward yeah. 
20 hypertext is just years. a fad yeah no seriously just like javascript javascript is a fad too yeah oh man anyway don't mean to get distracted on javascript but um i can remember i think it was like 1997 maybe uh i'd been playing with linux for a couple of years slackler mostly but there was a couple distributions out there that everybody knew red hat was one of them it was still in its early days and my older cousin he's about 10 years older than i he had a compositing business for graphics and he wanted to put together a website or something and so he asked me to come over and help him get linux installed i think he wanted it installed on a power pc so that was an interesting challenge and then i and then he immediately messed it up by putting websphere on top of that i didn't know enough then to tell him not to do that but uh yeah, even back in 1997, it was still massive. It took like an hour to install then. It hasn't improved. It takes over an hour to install now, and here it is 20 years later. Anyway, I think um, it's been since that point that I've been trying to help other people with Linux, I think, because I realized I'm fascinated in this thing. I think it's beautiful and wonderful, and here's open source. I think all of these things that we're doing are, are great. How can I help other people to see that they're great also? Yeah, so that that more or less wraps up well, the history that I'm willing to share, at least. Uh, JT, how about you? What, how did you get involved in Southeast Linux Fest? Let's ask that. Well, okay, we'll get there. Let's actually step back to the Slackware stuff that I was we were talking about earlier. So th the reason that I ended up on Slackware was a complete random chance. Uh, a family friend was a Windows admin, which, you know, Windows was amazing back in those days. Um, and anytime I had a problem with DOS or Windows, I would ask him, like, well, what do I do? Well, he was getting really sick of this kid who kept bothering him with these questions because he was at home. He didn't want to deal with any of that now because that's work and he doesn't want to think about that when he's off the clock. So eventually he got really, really annoyed with me, which I completely understand now. I can, I can sympathize. So he went to one of the guys in his company and asked him to install something that wasn't Windows for, for me to use. That guy was actually a FreeBSD admin. Um, he decided that he didn't want to install FreeBSD because he didn't want to become the support guy. <laughs> so he installed Slackware, and it was like, okay, well, I can't answer any questions now. So if he runs into any problems, well, that's on him. So I got this box with Slackware installed. No idea how to use it. Knew nothing. And it was like, well, what am I supposed to do? And they're like, well, there's this command called man, and it'll tell you how to use the other commands. So, I mean, it was just going through man pages to figure out, I don't know any of this stuff. How does any of this work? Running into problems I couldn't figure out and then hopping over to another machine so I could get onto IRC so I could then ask somebody. Uh, so, yeah, it was just kind of this natural, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, there's a dog typing on the keyboard. It was basically that for quite a while, <laughs> uh, but it was interesting. It was curious. I liked it. It was a it was an adventure to learn. It seems like someone this this person dropped you in the ocean and said, "Okay, time to learn to swim. Don't mind that there's a storm coming in ten minutes." Oh yeah, yeah. It was definitely and, yeah. You managed to swim. Trial by fire. Well, um, on the job training, as as we would say these days for work. So anyway, yeah. So I, I bounced around for a while. I stayed on Slackware for a long time quite simply because I didn't want to have to try to install it because I didn't I didn't do it the first time so I didn't know how to do it again so I was kind of like yeah let's just let's just not <laughs> uh, eventually I've heard worse reasons eventually I I used I installed OpenSUSE um, because that was actually at the time was based on Slackware so I figured it would be the most familiar uh, I tried an early version of Red Hat I think it was maybe something in the 4 series I don't know uh, it, I didn't like it it's not that it was bad it just it was different, and at the time, I didn't know enough, so different was bad. I was I was happy and, and comfortable with Slackware, so I stayed with that. Um, and it was just, you know, casually used it and learned and grew with Slackware. And then in the, I guess it would be early to mid-2000s, uh, I got started using Puppy Linux because I liked some of the technologies that they were using. I found it really interesting, some of the things that they were doing. And then in the late 2000s, I actually became one of the developers uh, helped with a couple of the releases there, put out a couple of releases. Then I uh, got met at Southeast Linux Fest, as a matter of fact. I met this guy called Ken Moore of the PCBSD project, uh, who was working on a new desktop. And I talked with him with quite a while, really liked what he was doing. Uh, I actually ported it to run on Slackware back then. I think that was around 2014. 
Uh, but it was basically, you know, I, I just wanted to play around with this new desktop that I thought was pretty neat. And then over time, I got more involved with helping him. And then he kind of used that to slide me into helping out with the PCBSD project, which became the True OS project, which then in 2018, um, the True OS project decided to spin off the desktop and just focus on server editions. So Ken and I started Project Trident, which is still going on, but now it's not based on FreeBSD, it's based on Void Linux. So it's been it's been a very roundabout voyage uh, it's, and adventure. It's been an odyssey, it sounds like. Yeah, it's been all over the place. Pretty good analogy, um, if, if I'm being honest, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with lots of, you know, shipwrecks and lots of crashes. And which part lots was of... the grapes? Which part would you say is eating the grapes? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I haven't even gotten there yet. Oh, so, boy. Okay, so yeah. we're halfway through your journey. So anyway, uh, yeah, I've been going to Self since, I think, 2014, maybe 2013. I can't remember. I've been to a couple other conferences as well, Linux Fest Northwest, Ohio Linux Fest, Texas Linux Fest. So yeah, I uh, one of the things that I have been lucky enough to do is that I've been involved with Jupiter Broadcasting for a long time. And I was the producer of the Linux Action Show and Linux Unplugged. I started doing that back in 2013, continued doing that for a long while. I'm now the producer of BSD Now. I'm also the producer for the Ask Noah Show, which is on KEQQ FM. That's fun. And now I am doing this show because why wouldn't I do something myself when I've been doing other people's stuff for so long and doing production? It just kind of makes sense for, hey, maybe, maybe I should do this. It's like the guitar tech who's been setting up somebody else's guitar forever knows it intimately and says, I got all these songs. Why don't I just do this too? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So anyway, you and I have been having these conversations for a long time about different things in technology and in Linux and in open source. And, you know, okay, granted, I'm a little biased, but I do think that they've been, they've been good conversations and we've, we've been able to think about and consider things from different angles. And, you know, because I've done podcasting for so long, the thought was, well, again, why don't I just do that? So I asked you and you were, you were down for it. So yeah, here we are and we're doing a thing. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. So uh, for those that are wondering, well, what exactly is the focus of this? Well, the focus is kind of be kind of varied. Uh, some aspects will be just about open source, Linux, Unix, etc. But things that we see repeating, you know, Jeff and I have been around the block a few times. We've seen certain ideas continue to come back up and then, nope, that's a bad idea. And it gets put away. And then sooner or later, it, it comes back up again because it's the new great idea. It's like, well, actually, we've, we've been down that road before and it didn't work out last time or the time before that. Or the, or the time before that. So because we've seen that a couple times, I think we are in a good spot to when they come up again, because they inevitably will, uh, we have the perspective of it sounds like a great idea at the surface. Here's the reasons it didn't work the last five times we tried this. So that's one thing is sort of that reflection, that historical viewpoint of when this came up before, this is why it didn't work. Now, hey, maybe... Maybe those reasons can be addressed with the new thought process, but let's not just keep trying to repave the same strip of ground the same way that we've done that hasn't worked every time we've done it. So that's one. Uh, obviously, with a show name like The Opinion Dominion, we cannot go without discussing things that are annoyances for us in this space. And, you know, we're human, just like everybody else. There are things that drive us crazy uh, that maybe don't bother other people, or maybe there are things other people haven't thought about. So there will be the occasional rant here and there, but we'll keep it, we'll keep it within reason. Touching on both of those, some episodes we will cover certain thought process aspects to explain the reasons behind why something is, whether that's why something is designed the way it is, or why, you know, as mentioned before, why a certain way of doing things is not a good idea and we should do it a different way. So we want to try to not just speak at people, but to explain things from a historical and also a sort of an educational point of view to give a better understanding as to why some things are the way they are. Yeah, so there's a going to be a actually a large historical aspect of this podcast. I think just by the nature of you and I having been around for as long as we have in the Linux, let's say the Linux business, and necessarily because we've been around for so long, it's going to be some degree of two old men grumping about the state of things today and how we used to do them back in the day. And that's when I'll have to get out my cane and rattle it a little bit and 
We'll try to keep the can thing to a minimum, but invariably it will come out. Just that's the nature of what we're trying to do here. We we peel apart the layers of how things are now. Maybe bring in some historical element. And you can see the progression of things. I've always felt that you can't understand the present without a very firm understanding of what happened at least immediately before. And I've been fascinated with the history of open source, and you can see these evolution of things. And sometimes when you try and figure out, well, why are we doing it this way? And you go and look, and you find out that it was because there was an argument on an issue on this project somewhere, and two people really started to hate each other, so then one of them forked the project. And because of that one issue or that one hatred, some new wonderful thing is born. That's happened more times than anyone would care to admit. Well, honestly, there's a lot of ego that goes involved is involved in trying to say, I know better than the original creator of this, I'm going to fork it and do it myself. But that's part of the beauty of open source and what we're doing. And honestly, I'm fascinated with those kind of things. I'm also fascinated with how pieces work together, breaking down systems. And I guess to my core, I just want to understand how things go. I take them apart. I put them back together. And that's pretty much how I learned Linux in the early days. You were talking earlier about reading lots of man pages and I joked that you were being tossed into the ocean at the deep end. I tossed myself in the ocean and I was like, okay, here's the tools. Let's go pick it apart. I actually learned how to write shell scripts by reading through Slackware startup scripts from start to, you know, very beginning to very end. And so for a while, my shell scripts bore the artifacts of the kinds of things that you see in Slackware's startup script. There were some, you know, key things that you'll see. I had to break some of those bad habits. There was actually quite a lot of bad habits built into the Slackware startup scripts just between you and me and the three listeners. But Oh, there's more than three listeners. There's literally a dozen of them. A dozen? Wow. A dozen. When yeah. did that happen? I'm, I'm impressed. Thank you, dozen. And thank you for the nine that have jumped on since we started. I really appreciate it. Happy to have you guys along. Well, I figure, you know, your wife is going to be listening, your dad's going to be listening, and your mom's going to be listening. So there's at least three right there. So I think, I think maybe through people I know, I can get another nine people. Okay. I think. So we have our 12. Hello, yeah. 12. Thank you very much for listening to our first episode. So about other people, uh, guess is definitely something that we are we are going to be doing. This is not just going to be Jeff and myself. Uh, our plan is to routinely have other guests come on to talk about, you know, their viewpoint on issues or what frustrations they have or their perspective of an event that happened in the past, so that we can get that varied viewpoint from someone else who's also been in the space for a long time. Having done, as I mentioned before, podcasts for quite a while, I've got a I've got a few people that I know in the in the Linux space that we can we can have on to talk about things. Uh, so you know we'll we'll be able to get more viewpoints than just two old grumpy guys. Well, that's actually very valuable because uh, honestly, you and I have the similar opinions on a lot of things, and we we kind of need an outside opinion at least to stir the pot, or else this will just be well, it is technically named opinion dominion. That would be appropriate. But we really would love to have a, a wide variety of guests on. And not, I, I, I hope not just from the open source community, but you know, maybe we could have some people coming. I would love to have someone on from Microsoft to explain how they're doing their approach to modern open source. Because I know it's evolved a lot, especially in the last five years. And I have to ask myself, do I trust Microsoft now? And it would be lovely to hear, for instance, someone explain their strategy to us. I think that would be fascinating to me. And necessarily, we would go into the history of well, why has it changed since before? Things like that. I would love to have wildly different viewpoints and very interesting guests. And I'm really looking forward to chewing the fat with these guests, as we say. Yeah, and in that same, in that same token, one of the other things that I have loved about other shows that I've done production for is uh, the feedback element, and that's the interaction with the people who is the listening audience. And that is something that I am adamant is going to be a part of this show. And I would, I would love for it to be a large chunk of the show. Um, my, my goal is to sort of get it to the point where it's at least one third of the show is community engagement in that, you know, we are going to be reading people's emails and responding to what they say. Uh, now, obviously, there's going to be some, some spin up time where it's going to take a while to build an audience to get a steady stream of feedback. But that is the goal is that this is not just me saying what I think. And this is not just Jeff saying what he thinks, but we want that feedback from other people. So if we have a, a topic which I know is going to come up, which is open source companies using very specific closed source tools, even though there's an open source variant of that, you know, I may have a strong opinion on that. Uh, I think Jeff will have a pretty strong opinion on that. But there may be others who are like, well, okay, here are the reasons why it makes sense that you didn't think of 
and maybe we'll agree with you maybe we won't but we can still get that feedback in from the listeners and kind of open that up to a larger discussion so we can get all the perspectives because just looking at things from one point of view it limits you in your understanding of a situation and the more perspectives you have the stronger you can then be in your personal decision you may end up still believing the same thing you believed before the conversation but now you have a stronger basis for why you believe that because you've faced all these contradicting ideas and you've decided that no i agree with them or i don't agree with them so yeah now obviously the volume that we get we don't know what that's going to be yet um and i know with the shows that i've worked on the volume varies sometimes it's just a trickle and sometimes it's a tsunami so we can't say for certain that every email we get is going to end up in the show i would love to be able to do that but depending on how much we get we don't want to make it an eight hour show but what i can say is that every single email that is sent in uh will be responded to uh, obviously unless it's just absolutely blatant spam or something like that but if you send in an email and you don't hear us mention it in the next show or you don't get a response from us and it's been a week or two send it back because this is something i'm very serious about is having that community engagement with other people getting that opposing or you know a, a feedback that people that are in agreement with us it's not just two guys i mean it is just two guys but it's also everybody else as well it's two guys plus the community that would be listening and and the greater community that may choose not to be interactive now, because imagine there's going to be some people that don't care to share their opinion, but still want to hear the opinions of others. There'll be a fair amount of that. And I think it's important that we would encourage those folks to go ahead and just send a, send us a note about what you're thinking about this topic. Because we really do. We would love to have a lot of understanding of what the community at large feels about various things. Because like I said, we're just two old grumpy Linux guys. And probably we're going to share a similar viewpoint on a lot of things. The ones we don't will get very contentious very quickly. But I imagine we'll both agree something and maybe a large percentage of the community feels differently and they will let us know vehemently. And I would love to hear that. And I would, I can see us spending a significant amount of airtime. I don't want to say addressing isn't the right word, but uh, trying to understand other people's viewpoints. And it will be a little bit, a bit of a challenge because it won't necessarily be interactive, but if you have an interesting enough opinion and we think it's a valuable topic, we may even reach out to you and say, Hey, would you like to come on and be a guest? So when you send us information or you send us opinions, try to be interesting without being crass, but interesting and, and thoughtful because we really do want to explore all sides of a, of a viewpoint or all sides of a topic as much as we can. To lead off of what Jeff just said, we will censor your email if you're getting crazy uh, in a response and we're going to read that and have that on the show. I mean, you we may still have it on there, but we are going to kind of filter that down a little bit um, if you kind of go off the rails. So just, just do keep that in mind. Uh, for the meantime, this is going to be just an audio-only show. I do hope at some point that we're able to work video into it. However, as world events would have it, uh, webcams have massively skyrocketed in price because anybody that has one now thinks it's worth its weight in gold. So a camera that was an $80 camera is now selling for like $280, and that's just ridiculous. So video is going to have to wait for a little while. We will hopefully bring that in as an aspect at some point. That being said, however, if, you know, somebody has a pair of those Logitech Brio cameras just kind of lying around, not being used, we will happily use them and return them when we can get our own stuff. But uh, so for right now, it's going to be audio only, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to step things up a little more yeah so i was really disappointed when i went looking for the you know looking for the simple logitech camera that you had recommended i i check into and i was like is it supposed to be this expensive and i came i pointed him to this i guess i found it on amazon he was like it's how much and we we just couldn't believe it and then realized well i guess since everybody's trapped in their homes there's a very big market for it all of a sudden and they're literally i've seen it as high as 350 dollars. someone trying to sell that logitech was it c90 or whatever it is yeah the c920 and it's just it's c920 thank you it just seems absurd but at the same time i can't fault someone from trying to take advantage of an opportunity like that it's not it's not like you're trying to sell gasoline or food and you're gouging me you're trying to sell me a Logitech camera. It's not technically necessary for my survival. So, okay, you know, I'm a, I'm a capitalist at heart. Go ahead and do it. I just will choose not to buy your overpriced, simple consumer camera. 
and we're hopeful that we'll be able to add the video element soon. But given how things are going, and I still haven't seen a resupply of Logitech cameras in any places because I keep looking, and they're still not coming back in stock. Or if they are, they're getting bought before I can see them. Uh, it's it could be a couple days at least, maybe maybe a week, maybe a week. It, it could be a little bit longer than that. I don't know. We'll see. But that's uh, we'll shoot for video in the near future, and uh, hopefully you'll be fascinated by because I know I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the what's behind me, and there's actually kind of a lot of interesting things, and there's a lot of interesting things on the wall behind JT. So I could see us having whole discussions of just going over the history of the stuff that we have within range, and there's tons of topics over JT's left shoulder, actually. So I could see us just like starting at the top left and working our way down. I, I should have stuff over both shoulders that's interesting, actually. You do, but I'm I'm focusing more on the on the history side because that's more where I lean. But you've got a lot of interesting hardware on the other side too. Oh, yeah. okay. Now he's cheating. He's moving. He's moving the See, viewpoint. There's a lot of there's a lot of old uh, history on that wall too. Oh, you are not kidding. So just just for reference, we're using very very poor um, computer cameras that don't work very well. At least so we can see each other. But that's um, we'll we're hoping to upgrade, and we don't want to give you the the really poor computer feeds. We want to give you something that looks decent. At least give us a, a fighting chance of looking okay on camera, as opposed to these things that we've got right now. Yeah, these are uh, high definition potato cams, is what we're using. They're uh, really, really great. I love the, the potato cam. That's that's pretty accurate right there. Uh, so anyway, with all this being said, you know, keep in mind that this is sort of the plan. But as we all know in reality, plans change. Things sometimes don't go the way you think. And well, you just you, you roll with the punches and you make the best of it. So we can't categorically say how things will develop, but they are going to develop somehow. Uh, hopefully that's a positive thing. Uh, but if not, you know, maybe you can just sit back and, and, and enjoy the, the train wreck if it goes that direction as well. I mean, if we can if we can provide <laughs> entertainment for you, that's that's good for me. I'm pretty sure no matter what else happens, there will be entertainment. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And you'll hear, the, you'll hear the cane rattling around, too. How about that? We'll have a cane alarm. Yeah. This was episode zero. Uh, we don't have any of the other like, details for Telegram channels and site yet. So that will be done shortly. And then any relevant info will be put onto the show notes, which will be posted wherever they're going to be posted, which I haven't decided yet. Because, you know, for having done this for... Oh, seven years at this point. You think I would have this down like clockwork? And I mean, the actual production stuff I do, but the spinning up part, I just, thankfully, I think, I don't spin up enough new programs to where I've really got that down as a smooth process yet. So still some bumps in the road as far as that goes, but we will get everything sorted and up and hopefully... Uh, you will enjoy it. Well, it's kind of like I, I have been you know, programming in various languages for a long time, and I have worked on a code base for months and months and months, and I feel very comfortable with it. I know exactly how every part works. Oh, I have a green field, something I need to go build over here, and I, I can't remember how to start a project. What do I do? I have to go Google how to start a new project in Eclipse or whatever. So, I, you know, it makes perfect sense. You're very used to the everyday aspect of this, but uh, bootstrapping a new program, there's just a lot of moving parts to get back. And uh, we will get all those moving parts going and, as we say, flying in the same direction here soon. Just give us a little bit of time. Oh, the other thing. This is important. This is this is very important. This might be the most important thing I have said this entire time. And that is, be excellent to each other. 